us think of Fiat as being these little tiny cars, but this thing is a nine liter, bigger than a Dodge Viper, and it's only four cylinders, correct? Absolutely, Dave. Yeah. Wow. We're in a 1911 Fiat Tipo Se, a Type 6. And of course, the Fiat company was founded in 1899, built their first car in 1900. And of course, as you know, there was no such thing as the low end of the market in 1900. So all manufacturers built cars that were for luxury. They were yeah. for the very wealthy, the very adventurous automobilists. And I'm thinking 1911, this must have been a very fast car because most cars in this period, I run out of first gear at two to three miles an hour. This first gear was good for about 20 something miles an hour, maybe even 30. So I'm thinking it's rather long legged and and it feels like it might have a top speed of at least 60 miles an hour. Absolutely, Jay. In fact, you hit on something very interesting about the history of this particular car. Um, Fiat had established a manufacturing plant here in the U.S. in 1910 in Poughkeepsie, New York. And this car was sold, of course, to uh, an American who first had a racing body built for the car by a piano company in New York, a very lightweight racing body, and he actually drove this chassis in the 1911 Vanderbilt Cup race. Wow. It was later rebodied uh, twice, and the body it's currently wearing is a period body by a coach builder that you're very familiar with, Holbrook of New York. Oh, sure. Holbrook built my uh, Simplex crane. Exactly. And this was the body originally fitted to a Simplex. And uh, again, the character of this body is absolutely perfectly suited for this big, luxurious Fiat. You know, funny, we think, you usually think of Holbrook as building these massive town cars and, and, and touring cars. I guess this would fit right in. And it's a very sporty thing as well. Uh, so you, you get that feeling of sort of lightness and yet incredible luxury. You know, the way the dashboard is finished and of course the brass trim is just absolutely amazing. You know, it's funny. I mean, we're here on Bellevue Avenue uh, and yet we're going with the flow of traffic. This car is 109 years old and yet I feel like I'm using it like a modern car. The brakes are a little dicey, <laughs> but it isn't like a chuck a bang, chuck bang, bang. I mean, it's very smooth. It's reasonably quiet. Speed limit says 25 or 35. You get right up there and you go. You know, it's it's actually fine. In fact, around town, I don't think I I, I just assumed I would be in fourth gear by now. I'm in second, and I feel like I'm lugging it. So yeah, exactly. This car wants to run, and yeah. with that wonderful uh, original period. Uh, Warner uh, speedometer. Yeah, we're going about 25 miles per hour right now. Right, right. So it's uh, a car for Newport and a car very, very much at well, home let's here. Go back to that nine liter four. Each piston's literally the size of a paint can. And we're driving by right now the carriage house for the great Breakers Mansion. It's very interesting also to see, of course, that cars like this in this time required, as you know, massive maintenance. Right. And so the staff of chauffeurs had to work very, very hard to keep them running and uh, to make sure that they were ready at a moment's notice. So you can tell that uh, this car could certainly hold its own. Yeah, it's quite powerful. Can't hold its own when it's stopping, but... <laughs> well, back in 1911, motorists were far more concerned with going than stopping. Right. The traffic was so incredibly light. And uh, even then, the biggest challenge would have been Running into a uh, running into a horse, so it's also very interesting, Jay, as we uh, drive through Newport, that this end of town was the country. Of course, Newport is a very very old city, uh, founded in the 17th century with a great 18th century history, and of course people are very familiar with the great 19th century cottages on Bellevue Avenue, but this end of town, in the middle of the 19th century was still very much the country. Right. Nobody lived down here. Wow. Newport is an amazingly historical place. Yeah. Um, with history on land, in the water. Uh, it's just it's an astonishing place where, you know, the thing that I love so much about Newport, and I know you do as well, is the fact that Newport lives its history. Right. Uh, as you're walking through, driving through Newport, it is not as if you are in some sort of a, a potted, uh, facsimile of history. It's not Sturbridge Village. No. Exactly. This is a place that people still live their lives in and make their lives in. And to me, it's what's so fascinating. You know, driving a car like this 1911 Fiat that has Newport connection here in Newport again 
in 2020 is absolutely astonishing. Today we've arrived here at Seaweed in this amazing 1911 Fiat and we talked about its racing history. Let's take a look at that incredible power plant. Yeah. Here's this magnificent nine liter four cylinder engine. This is obviously the exhaust side, not the induction side. Well, I'm just amazed at how clean it is. In fact, this is unusual that this is the part of the exhaust system and then it exits here. You know, I mean, you couldn't put a set of headers on this, obviously. Right, exactly. But the cylinder head, how thick that must be. And it's also interesting to think about the fact that this car first started as a competition car. Right. And it's interesting to me that I just noticed, and this is something that I'm sure that's very familiar to you because you're really into this era of car, the fact that the way the engine mounts are, made, are, are, are created and the way they attach to the frame, the engine is actually a stressed member. Yeah, yeah. Which is, again, sort of, we think of this as very modern, advanced thinking, but this is how they manufactured the cars back then. And I'm surprised there's not two spark plugs per cylinder. But again, it is 1911, so it's really, it's, it's really quite early. But it's quite interesting, thinking about the transformation of this chassis from a racing car to a touring car, right. which brings us to the story of this house, Seaweed. This house was built at a time that this was pure countryside. A tailor, very successful, by the name of Alfred Smith, no relation to the governor of New York, bought 140 acres at the south end of Newport in 1850. Wow. that he wanted to develop as a place for summer homes. And it's quite interesting because at that time, the city was really much more centered back on the northern end where the 18th century part of the city was. People had just begun to venture out into the country toward the ocean down here. And uh, this house, the original house here was built in the 1860s, 1861, the first house was finished, and it was a chalet by the beach, a very country, very casual house. And in 1901, it was purchased by a fellow Thomas Dolan from Philadelphia. And he decided that he needed something rather more grand for his uh, vacation residence. He's a fellow who electrified the entire city of Philadelphia. Oh, okay. So, you know, this is a place to get out of the heat of Philadelphia into the, 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 the wonderful sea air away from the Jersey Shore, which a lot of Philadelphians went to. He came up here. And what he did was he had Horace Trumbauer create this house which we as we see today which has a wonderful grand feel and yet it's still very casual it's still a beach house the extension of bellevue avenue through former farmland in the late 1850s made the building of what would become seaweed and its neighbors possible from its humble seaside chalet beginnings in 1861 six years later the small home built for henry howard was expanded by architect george champlin mason for its second owner william mckay who quickly sold it to colonel george davis by 1882, it was back in the hands of the developer, Alfred Smith, who sold it in 1901 to Thomas Dolan. The Dolan family would remain at Seaweed for 107 years before selling to the current owners in 2008. Storms are a constant threat to these coastal homes, and in 1954, Hurricane Carol took the porte cochere off the front of Seaweed. The current owners rebuilt it as part of the painstaking restoration work they've done. Today, seaweed is fully enjoyed by multiple generations of the family. From simple beach chalet to imposing but welcoming colonial revival home, seaweed is all you would expect in a memorable Newport mansion. Well, the thing I like about it, this part of the country is the architecture is not subject to every sort of new whim that comes along like Los Angeles where you have like a Taco Bell and then a, a Spanish mission looking house and then some flying buttress thing, you know, a picture Oh, taken every decade would show a different car in this parking lot, but basically the same house. I mean, the rooms are small and comfortable. There's a fireplace in each room. That's what I like. It's the classic back east kind of house, a big porch you can go out on and sit down and relax. It's really beautiful. Absolutely. And much like this Fiat, seaweed also shows its history. You can still see that 1860 house inside the envelope of the 1901 house. And it also takes amazing advantage of this setting, which is absolutely beautiful here, looking out in this little cove by the beach and out to the ocean. As a matter of fact, I can see a house over there that uh, might be a little familiar to you. Yeah, well, that's my house, actually. Exactly. You know, this place would be a really terrific place if they could only get rid of that obstruction in the exactly, view. Exactly, you know? exactly. But, uh, but nonetheless, this is a beach house. And of course, what do you want at a beach house? Probably a woody station wagon? Works for me. Let's take a look at one. So 
day, when we were in the 1911 Tipo 6, we talked about small Fiats, and here we are with a very small Fiat, a Topolino. Well, you know, it's interesting. In 1911, there was no income tax. The Fiat was big. This is after income tax. The government has literally taken two-thirds of the Fiat, and this is what you're stuck with. That's a Fiat before taxes. This is a Fiat after taxes. And, and you look can really that, tell under the hood. And look at the engine, hilarious, 600 cc's. Look how tiny it is. And again, that classic Fiat, unusual design, the radiator is behind the motor, not in front of it, which is, you'd think you'd get more engine heat, but that's just the way they did it. And uh, Dante Giacosa, who designed the, the Topolino, was absolutely brilliant engineer, and this is a, an amazingly marvelous use of space. The amazing use of packaging here uh, predates actually the Mini, which is, which yeah. is held as a, uh, a great uh, example of great packaging, because you have your engine, gas tank, and room for two passengers plus a great deal of luggage in this model, which is called the Giardiniera, yeah. or a gardener, in fact. And this is the wood-bodied version. You know, it's interesting. Whenever people come to my garage, I show them my uh, 1937 Topolino. I say to the tallest person, you think you fit in here? No. And they get inside, and they actually have to move the seat forward because you can put the seat so far back that there's, I mean, your feet come all the way up to here with this car. You'd think in most cars, the engine in the firewall is here, but here it's way up here. So there's actually quite a bit of room. And this is a piece of like, well, it almost feels like fiberboard, isn't it? It's fiberboard. It's it exactly is fiberboard. fiberboard and that's, that's the correct construction. Okay. This is what they did before carbon fiber. These are just ways to save weight. So you only had 600 cc's. And you also had enough power to actually carry some cargo in this yeah, as well. Yeah, so. They were very, very practical. And in the uh, pre-war period, this is the Topolino's the car that was to Italy what the Model T was to America. Right. This is the car that really motorized Italy. And even after the war, continued to be very, very popular until the introduction of the Cinquecento in 1955. Well, they always call the Volkswagen the people's car, but this predates it by 10 years. Because exactly. the Volkswagen really didn't show up. But the designs are there pre-war, but didn't show up till after the war. This, they started building this in 36, so there you go. Let's show them the American version of uh, a Fiat, because uh, like uh, Italians to Americans, the Americans are a little fatter, a little taller, a little wider. They need just a little bit more power. Come on, I'll show Let's you what I'm talking about. Fill with that beach about. spirit. Exactly. Great beach houses are active living houses. And for an active living house, you want the great look of a woody wagon, but you also want the functionality. This is what people would call a restomod, but very mild restomod because it looks almost completely, actually looks completely stock from the outside. But under the hood, it's got a 350 Chevy engine. Right, and disc brakes I see as well. Disc brakes, 250 horsepower, uh, nice uh, automatic transmission. And so this is a car that you can effortlessly cruise around wherever you'd like to go. I'm saying this is what, 39, 40 Chevy, something? A 1939 Chevy Master Deluxe. Well, I, I always love the names that have gone out of favor. The Chevy Master, the Studebaker Dictator, <laughs> the Buick <laughs> Caballero, you know, just names, it, it's whatever you can't, you know, you, you can't really use anymore. For you, can just, you can just imagine the, the, the smoke-filled rooms with uh, the yeah. over-brimming ashtrays and the well, martinis and the scotch glasses they the came Studebaker, up with these what are you, things. I'm driving a dictator, it's a Studebaker dictator. It commands the road. Yeah, well, it, they had the commander as well, so yeah. the dictator, commander. the commander, yeah, yeah. the commander. An, an yeah. Hierarchy of, uh, yeah. of mastery yeah. uh, on the road. But you know, it's very interesting too because a car like this has such incredible style. You know, right. the Chevrolet obviously is the entry level in the General Motors ladder of brands. And this car for 1939 has, to me, a lot of the style of a 1939 Buick or Cadillac. You know, plus it, I, I like a resto mod like this where we haven't lost the character of the car. Sometimes I see these resto mods and where's the 55 Chevy that was here? Where's the I mean, you've used the sheet metal, but I mean, to me, half the fun is looking at the old style gauges, right. you know, the Bakelite knobs. Uh, the one thing that drives me just crazy, I'm glad it's not here, is when I see a car from the 20s or 30s with the tilt-away steering wheel. Yeah, it, just, it just drives me nuts, because I realize the character of the car is gone. I mean, this has got 
plenty of power and it's got two space. It's good to be able to stop and, and it's good to be able to go. And seat belts to keep the family safe. You got seat belts. Yeah, so no, it's great. This is nicely done, not overdone. This is, this is a, if I was going to buy a resto mod that wasn't all about horsepower, it would be this, yeah. And that's another thing that you mentioned. It's not a hot rod, it's a resto mod. Right. It's not got some 400 horsepower, uh, you know, Corvette engine under the hood. It's a nice 350, you know, normal power output so you can get yourself, family, friends to the beach with a cooler in the back and maybe a couple of surfboards on the roof. Yeah. Want to go surfing? Oh, that's us. Yeah, Donald and I surfing. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's going to happen real soon. But all right, let, let's 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 do half of it anyway. We'll at least go for a ride. Exactly. Oh, a rather different experience uh, driving through Newport this time in the 1939 Chevy. Uh, here along the ocean. Yeah, well, you know what's funny to me? It doesn't seem different to me. The thing I find unusual about living here is you could be at any time in the 19th or the 20th century. When I'm here, I don't really turn on the TV much. You're outside a lot, you're around the ocean, you're around old cars. Uh, and every old car we've had, even as far back as the 1911 Fiat, which is the oldest car we drove, the houses were built before that, most of them. In fact, the, this area has more pre-colonial homes than almost anywhere in America because the British did not burn it down. Rhode Island was sort of a stronghold for them. For the Tories, yes. Yeah, at, at one point, you know? So when you're driving along in a 39 Woody wagon, someone probably drove along past these exact same houses. You know, my wife grew up in L.A. Not only is her school not there anymore, the street it was on and the hill has been leveled. It's like the whole neighborhood was in the witness protection program and they just eliminate everything. You know, growing up in New England, I go back to my old high school and, and some of my teachers are still there. <laughs> I mean, they're like 85 years old and it's unbelievable. That's the, uh, that is the, the glory of, of this part of the world. And uh, the fact that cars of, of all ages can just feel right at home. Right. They fit in. Exactly, exactly. And I'll tell you, it's a lot of fun also. I love driving in Woody's of this period because it's just such a statement of industrial completeness. You know, the fact that you've got the, the wood artisans, you have the, the metal, the wonderful design. People are really looking to have great style statements that are also practical and usable. Yeah, that's true. I, I have to admit, I, I've never really gotten into the woody thing because the wood maintenance is so extensive. I don't mind doing mechanical maintenance. I hate sanding and shellacking and doing all of that. It just seems like it shouldn't be necessary, but it is every single year. Exactly. It's like maintaining a vintage uh, wood boat. It is. This, um, and although, this is a wood boat. It's right. Just, except <laughs> it's just not in water. When I moved to California 11 years ago from the East Coast, I thought, well, I'm leaving behind all of my issues of car maintenance for the winter. You know, right. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff anymore. And where I lived in the California desert, I had new issues of the extreme dryness and what it does to rubber and all the seals in your engine and suspension if you don't use the car especially. Right. Um, but here, you have to know that living by the ocean with all the glories of it sort of amplifies that need for really constant attention to maintenance. Right, exactly. That's why I rent a car when I'm here. <laughs> well, we'll get you to keep more old cars here as well. So what is the, uh, what is the experience like driving this, uh, this resto mod? How does it feel? Well, you know, it feels just like a 39 Chevy, except it's got more power and it stops, which is exactly what a resto mod should be. When you get in a resto mod, if you can't feel or sense what you're driving, why did you bother? Why did you ruin it, you know? You know, yeah. resto mod is a new term. We would have called it updating the car. You right. just put, put better brakes on it and you put a little better engine in it. But I would almost, you know, as a kid, this is what I would have wanted. As an adult, I, well, I would have liked the 39 Chevy with the big six and the three on the tree and just the experience of, 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 of driving the car. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, they made the choices which are great for us who like the aesthetic and the feel of the original car. The fact that they left the original gauges in and the original clock and all the controls and also that wonderful uh, 
very period correct accessory fan next to the steering right. wheel, you know, so that you could get a cooling breeze if you weren't driving along the beach like we are right now. I see this would last 10 minutes in Newport in the with just salt water and off oh, this. Well, way. it lives here in Newport. Yeah, it's but a matter it lives of in a, a climate controlled sealed garage, you know. Well, I mean, that's the whole thing. Everything that 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 we touch, mechanical or the houses, all demand maintenance, and it is a very it, it demands a certain concentration and and commitment right to to maintain a car to maintain a house here along the ocean right right. you know it's, it's not uh, not for the faint-hearted that's for sure all of this beauty comes at a price now beauty comes at a price Jay you know you Obviously. can tell from the way I'm dressed you know it, it, it's well, not okay, easy to do this. Yeah. so Jay we've uh, sampled uh, motoring in Newport from the beginning of the 20th century through the middle of the 20th century to the 21st century in the 20th century and it shows how all of the Newport style just lasts. It's just something very special, something that is timeless. Yeah, I would just say it's fun to drive cars in an old town that hasn't changed much. That's pretty much the way I would say it. But uh, yeah, but we're basically saying the same thing though. Exactly. Yeah. You just say it in your sort of pizza way, I say it in my sort of salmon way. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. And fish tends to smell worse than pizza. <laughs> Depends on the topic.